Welcome to we're, we're, for this Royal Institute of Philosophy annual London lecture. We're, we're pleased to be back in person, having been banished to the internet for a, for a couple of years. And it's great to see such a large number of you um, coming out this evening to hear the talk. Since it began in 1998, this annual London lecture has seen some of the world's most important and influential philosophers in the Western tradition uh, give their talks. We've had the likes of Thomas Nagel, Alastair McIntyre, Bernard Williams, Mary Warnock, Christine Korsgaard, David Chalmers, Ray Langton, Patricia Churchland and Sally Haslanger most recently. And this year's speaker is a uh, notable addition to that list. Linda Martin Alkoff is Professor of Philosophy at Hunter College and a Graduate Centre at CUNY New York and her many books include Rape and Resistance, Understanding the Complexities of Sexual Violence, The Future of Whiteness, and the Franz Fanon award-winning Visible Identities, Race, Gender, and the Self. She writes for a number of also uh, more public-facing publications like the New York Times, Eon, and so forth. She often comes up in lists of the most influential and cited philosophers, one such list placing her third in these somewhat <laughs> strange kind of formal rankings that we become fond of in academic philosophy. We do have some roving microphones, so just raise your hand and we'll try to, to get to that. So without any further ado, would you please welcome Linda Martin Alkoff to give her talk, The Return of Cultural Racism. Thank you, Julian. Thank you all for coming out in this horrible weather. I'm, I'm very happy to be here at the LSE, where I've never been before. Um, my father got his PhD here in the mid-60s um, when he was a foreign student here from Panama. And he said all the third worlders went to LSE to study Marxism and go home and make revolution. <laughs> He wasn't able to make revolution, but he certainly never kept his, his mouth shut. And when he went back and there was um, a military dictatorship that took over just a few years after he returned, he, he opened his mouth and lost his, philosophy, his history position at the university for, for a number of years. It took him quite a while to get back. But he remembered his days here very positively. So I'm going to talk today about um, a topic that's still relevant for all of us. I know that anti-racism here is a little different from anti-racism back in the United States. But in the United States, it's become something of an industry these days, generating profits for publishers as well as hefty speaking fees for recognized experts. Anti-racist training is ubiquitous with identity-based affinity groups to follow up the lessons and every elite university and corporation and arts university has a DEI initiative referring to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Predictably though, the scope of the profitable sphere of anti-racism is restricted largely to the domain of individual prejudice and the diversification of the professional class. It's an attempt, as some have suggested, to rebrand privilege without relinquishing its prerogatives. And so the structural agenda of anti-racism is circumscribed to organizational improvement, not dismantlement, to inclusion without substantive change. When portions of the racist public are targeted, it's often the least elite members of society, those very much outside of these elite organizations. The topic of cultural racism I hope to show will help us to broaden the focus of anti-racism and shift the burden to governing elites, whether liberal or conservative. Cultural racism refers not only to racism in the sphere of culture, but to the, the alibi or the legitimating ground to justify exclusion. As Ramon Grossvogel notes, after the Second World War, there was an important shift in the global colonial racial formation. The Nazi occupation 
delegitimize biological racist discourses in many of the continental Western European countries. The decline of biological racist discourses did not imply the end of racism in the core of the capitalist world economy. After the defeat of the Nazi occupations in Western Europe and the 1960s civil rights struggles in Great Britain and the United States, global racial discourses shifted from biological racism to cultural racism, unquote. So Grossvogel is referring to the shift in the fundamental way in which racism identifies its targets and legitimates its agenda. And here Grossvogel is following Franz Fanon, who in a 1956 speech in Paris used the term cultural racism to explain the way in which the colonial powers were adapting to the discrediting of biological racism. With the language of culture, Fanon said, the material and political effects of racism could remain in force. Even so, the switch from biology to culture had important conceptual implications, as he showed. Biological racism was a claim about individuals based on their ancestry and geographical lineage. In this way, it denied individuals their individuality, a crime that liberal societies could not tolerate, steeped as they were in ideas about the value of the individual. Conveniently, cultural racism as Fanon said, no longer targeted the individual man, but a certain form of existing, unquote. Thus, individuals could be saved if they changed their ways. So in the shift from biology to culture, the target is no longer the individual, believed to manifest a certain biological type, but rather group ways of life. Cultural racism involves misperceptions of people, certainly, but it primarily involves certain kinds of misperceptions of peoples, that is, ways of being and living, or what Fanon called forms of existing. It's the dress, the religious practice, the community values, family formations, artisanal productions, and forms of cultural expression and gender expression, even the types of food that is eaten. All of these now, under the domain of cultural racism, can potentially become signs of backwardness or simply unbridgeable difference. And it is these practices that provide the alibi when societies want to exclude others. Artisanal creations don't meet the criteria of art, so are placed in archaeology museums instead. Religious practices conflict with liberal values and so can be excluded from the public sphere. Non-monogamous sexual practices were long condemned by the West, with some hypocrisy, of course, and so on. Thus, cultural racism cannot be countered by a, re a reminder of the rights of individuals. It's certainly wrong to preemptively judge a given individual's likely beliefs, attributes, and abilities on the basis of their connection to a cultural, ethnic, or religious group. But note that this focus on the individual does not necessarily challenge the overall assessment of the group. The individual could just be seen as an outlier. But if we're going to make use of this concept, we need to answer some further questions. The category of culture has undergone some reasonable skeptical critique in the social sciences recently. Is it even intelligible? And isn't animosity between cultural groups ancient? So what, if anything, makes cultural racism distinct? Can we distinguish between what makes one a cultural racist rather than a simple critic of a given cultural practice? I'll argue here that criticism is a legitimate practice and can even be a sign of respect if done in a dialogue. But the question is the grounds upon which we criticize a given culture and a given cultural practice. And looking at the typical grounds given for cultural judgments will help us understand the need for this category of cultural racism. So in what follows, I'm going to address these questions both about the concept of culture as well as the specificity of cultural racism, as well as a further one that's perhaps the most important, what is the most effective antidote to cultural racism. So first section, a bit on cultural racism. 
The category of culture is itself ineluctably vague, and yet it has a place in our collective common sense understanding of the world. Fanon expresses the familiar idea that cultures encompass specificities of behavior, practices, and doxa, the patterns of which demarcate ways of existing. Cultures have patterns and norms that present a choice structure for individual behavior with associated meanings as well as costs and benefits. I'll have more to say about the idea of culture later on, but we need to take note of when the concept of culture comes up in an explanatory way and when it does not. The concept often comes up when we are talking about the practices and institutions we don't like in other places places in the global south in particular, but less so as explanations of practices in our own cultures of the global north. This can give us an initial formulation of cultural racism as distinguishable from a simple dislike or critical stance toward a given practice, because it operates from a systematic ordering in which cultures are normatively ranked by criteria that are themselves seen as transcendent of culture and thus neutral and universal. The habit of characterizing some ideas and practices as cultural and others as simply enlightened or rational is characteristic of the modern colonial world system and set its approach apart from the more local forms of xenophobia based on preference or personal judgment. Is a judgment of a culture that's not presented as grounded in one's own culture, but is universal and culturally transcendent. Examples abound of negative judgments of difference. The Ganda people of Uganda complained that the food of foreigners was tasteless and likely to cause constipation. The Swahili took some foreigners to be superior, the Persians whose calendar they adopted, while they took other groups to be unkind and uncultured. Interestingly, most groups in the ancient world, such as the Chinese and many indigenous peoples of the Americas, apparently believed that persons from other cultures could assimilate and thus become one of them. The possibility of assimilation suggests a certain absence of determinism and essentialism, no matter the background or ancestry of a given individual. The issue of assimilability is a cornerstone of racism. Of course, there's another issue of whether any person or group should be forced to assimilate, but I want to separate that from the question of whether some individuals or groups are believed to be capable or incapable of assimilation, since this can be an indicator of a deterministic racialization. In the United States, for example, Asian Americans and Latin Americans have long been seen as unassimilable. Not because they're believed to have no culture, but because they're believed to have too much, especially in the case of Asians and the indigenous. Their cultures are too old, too substantive, and too continuous to the point of irrationality. Hence, the incapacity to assimilate is portrayed as a group problem rooted in their culture, not an individual failing or simple stubbornness. The ranking system that cultural racism deploys is made more powerful by its veneer of universal rationality and morality. The normative ranking of cultures is inevitably, as Fanon pointed out, unilaterally decreed. But in a circular argument, the unilateral nature of the decree is justified by the ranking itself. As Michael Hanchard argues, strategies of political exclusion have long relied on an absolutist form of judgment that decrees the universal criteria by which backwardness and advancement can be identified. And yet this allows neutral presenting judgments of culture to serve as proxy for judgments of race or color. Historians are today vigorously debating the genesis and duration of racism, a term that after all emerged only in the 20th century. Whether the phenomenon predates the modern period is predictably dependent on how we define it. I generally follow the approach of Francisco Betancourt in his massive study that was published in 2013 on the history of racism. <clears throat> 
His definition of racism is that it is, quote, prejudice concerning ethnic descent coupled with discriminatory action, unquote. This definition is broad enough to cover multiple epochs and parts of the world without being restricted to the specific use of the concept of race, which is a modern concept. But it is specific enough to be able to exclude any and every form of xenophobia adding on the element of, by adding on this element of discriminatory action. He wants to focus our attention to racisms motivated by and embedded within political and economic projects, such as nationalism and colonialism. Thus, his is less a conceptual argument than a historical account, and he argues in favor of his definition on the basis of how it directs our focus. Bethencourt makes four further orienting points that I find useful. First, as he explains, there's a long history of connecting behavior and moral worth to physical characteristics, such as the Greeks and Romans, who took the shape and strength of the body to indicate character and intelligence. The ancient world was also rife with theories of environmental determinism, linking climate and geography, and virtues and vices. So these ideas give us a way to think about a form of racism that predated the concept of race, a concept that only emerged in the modern period. But yet, Bethencourt suggests we can maintain the link with our modern concerns by paying special attention to when such theories were used to organize discriminatory actions and policies. Thus, racism predates the modern era by his definition, but every instance of prejudicial judgment should not be classified as racist. Second, in relation to this point, Bethencourt thinks it has been a mistake to make classification the determining criteria, such that racism could not exist before we had a concept of race. Many philosophers have argued this, including me, I think. <laughs> By contrast, Bethencourt points out that classification did not precede action. In all cases, groups could be targeted for exclusion and violence and seen as beyond salvation well before biological theories of racial identity emerged. The wider definition of racism that he puts forward will allow us to capture practices that are broadly similar. Third, Bethencourt argues and demonstrates the muddying of categorizing done on the basis of nature and culture, a point that's very relevant for the topic of cultural racism. Groups can be naturalistically defined or culturally defined, but one often sees that the formation of culture is taken to be the effect of the natural potential of a people. So for example, as Paul Taylor discusses, the rhythm-based, percussive, heavy music of many parts of Africa was taken to be the result of racial characteristics, while the putatively superior melodic-based music of Europe was interpreted as the effect of advanced intellectual capacity. We can still understand cultural racism as focusing on practices and doxa, but realize that these judgments may well incorporate biologically racist beliefs. And finally, despite finding instances of racism as he defines it in different epochs and parts of the world, Bethencourt explicitly rejects the inevitability of racism or the claim that it's part of human nature. He finds it to be more situational than innate, arising under certain contextual conditions. There is simply insufficient evidence to render racism innate, and there's countervailing evidence, as I will discuss further on. Criticisms of cultural beliefs and practices will continue, as they should, but they need to become disentangled from the political projects and methodological legacy of coloniality in which unilateral decrees and systems of ranking are taken to be epistemically blameless. Consider the universal language about advanced versus backward cultures. The, this distinction is sometimes made with use of the traditional versus historical distinction as developed in the 1950s by Mersha Aliade, the Romanian his, historian of religion, 
Eliade defines traditional cultures as those that characterize eternity as cyclical and engage in rituals of repetition of mythical or sacred events. Historical cultures, on the other hand, understand themselves as moving through an open or profane space without intrinsic meaning, thus allowing for greater freedom of innovation. If traditional cultures have the advantage of offering a substantive orientation to human life, historical cultures make up for this in an openness to change. From this, we can see how cultural racism targets cultures rather than individuals. If an individual has a lineage that can be traced to a traditional culture, the task of enlightenment will involve assimilation to a historical culture, which is the majority of culture. Note that this requires deculturation as a prior step to acculturation. But by accepting such individuals, societies of the global north can avoid the charge of racism and achieve putative diversity. If we use the lens of cultural racism, as I'm suggesting here, however, then we can no longer take the test of racism only to be whether majoritarian groups can accept minority individuals who deculturate. Fanon is interested in the mid-20th century shift from biology to culture because it emerged just as the anti-colonial revolutions were beginning to win formal independence. The potential that independence created to develop newly collaborative relations with the new nations was curtailed by the language of advanced versus backward cultures. Critics of extractive capitalism from former colonies were dismissed as simply lacking knowledge in economic expertise, or as dupes of the USSR. Fanon argued that, quote, a colonial country is a racist country, unquote. By this, he meant to disentangle racism from conscious racist intent or specific beliefs and instead focus on the structural organization of exploitation. Thus, he says, we must abandon, quote, the habit of considering racism as a mental quirk or a psychological flaw, unquote. But Fanon was also clear about the reciprocal action between racism and culture. He rejected the modernist hierarchy of cultures that makes use of the advanced backward or traditional historical binaries but he did not reject normative comparison. He believed there were cultures with racism and cultures without racism. The so-called advanced cultures of the West overcame what he describes as the, quote, vulgar, primitive, over simple racism, quote, unquote, that claimed biological causes. But these then simply gave way to what he describes as a, quote, more refined racism. Colonialism then could justifiably pursue, quote, the destruction of cultural values, of ways of life, language, dress, techniques were all devalorized, unquote. But the goal, he believed, was exploitation. Here's another passage. He says, in reality, the nations that undertake a colonial war have no concern for the confrontation of culture. The enslavement and the strictest sense of the native population is the prime necessity. But for this to work, the social panorama is destructured. Values are flaunted, crushed, emptied. The lines of force having crumbled no longer give direction, unquote. To destroy a culture, then, is to destroy collective resistance and to create the opportunity for a new system of values to be imposed. And one of Fanon's main concerns with the way in which colonization was fought on the terrain of culture is that the colonial cultures that attempt to resist don't disappear, but become mummified, closed, inhibiting individual thinking. Thus, the essentialism developed in some forms of cultural nationalism thwart needed transformations that might otherwise occur. And this, too, Fanon argues, functions for the colonial system. He says, quote, we witness the setting up of archaic, inert institutions, 
functioning under the oppressor's supervision and patterned like a caricature of formerly fertile institutions." Unquote. This culture then becomes, for the inferiorized or colonized, an object of passionate attachment, he says. So for Fanon, dissociating racism from colonialism is a form of misdirection that conceals what we most need to understand. The forms of modern racism we struggle against today have retained their force despite formal decolonization and without biological commitment to racial types. Yet they continue to make it possible for richer nations to maintain practices of extraction post-independence because of the long colonial history of ideas de developed to justify a hierarchy of cultures, sciences, and economic practices. Bringing cultural racism to the fore will help present racisms to this long period, will help, sorry, will help connect present racisms to this long period of the modern colonial world system and its enrichment of the global north. Protecting the rights to that enrichment is an ongoing task, and part of the way it is protected is by limiting immigration to those who can assimilate. It is cultural racism that garners wide public support for the exclusion of immigrants and refugees. It is also cultural racism that created the Indian boarding schools used in North America beginning in the 19th century that separated children from their families coerced assimilation and attempted to destroy languages, yet were portrayed as the humane alternative to genocidal practices. The idea, to paraphrase Sartre's account of anti-Semitism, was to kill the Indian but save the man. So in the next section, I'm going to talk a little bit more about culture. Edward Said noted in his book, Culture and Imperialism, that culture is a sort of theater where various political and ideological causes engage one another. His point was that expressive artistic productions, as well as the work of their interpretation and critique, can be sites of battle over how the past is represented, as well as how groups and nations are portrayed and judged. Empires endeavor always to control the narrative, and a central feature of colonial narratives involve the ranking of other cultures. Some want to protect literature and art and cultural products of all sorts in a kind of gated enclosure, Said says, as if it were possible to create a free space in which expressive art forms could be appreciated on their own to be seen as the production of a particular individual rather than a particular society. Culture should be judged by universal aesthetic criteria, not by its sociological origins or political effects on that view. But this, too, is a tactic of control, an attempt to methodologically invalidate certain lines of critique, and in this way protect what Said calls the pleasures of imperialism. Such pleasures can include the crafting of narratives in which colonizers are heroic civilizers. There can also be forms of imperial pleasure in the display of the spoils and in the unchallenged right to judge, interpret, and curate without oneself being judged, interpreted, or curated. Said is not imputing intentions to artists, but considering the meaning of artistic work, as well as their influence distribution and effects. In truth, the idea of enclosing culture and protecting it from crass political judgment is just not possible. Unless a great many people are muzzled, there will always be contestation over the merit and meaning of cultural productions. There will always be resistance to the enshrining of imperial narratives, and there will always be an effort to push against the censure of alternative narratives. In this book, Culture and Imperialism, Said is primarily focused on the high culture of the imperial centers, that is, the culture produced within the metropole for the consumption of its own communities, or at least the educated elites. In this sense of culture, or high culture, that was defined by Matthew Arnold in the 1860s as simply the, quote, reservoir of the best that has been known and thought. 
Thus, what today we might call Western high culture had, in Arnold's time, no geographical specificity, no context or qualifiers. The term culture signified a universal, and it was judged by putatively universal standards to justify its dominion over the mere crafts and myths produced by lower groups. The culture of the imperial centers was the paradigm or the standard bearer in genre and content. This approach created stark hierarchies. If the high culture of the West manifested the paradigm, then the only question subject to debate was whether non-Westerners or even the working classes and women of the imperial centers could achieve culture, could write in sonnet form, could produce symphonies and novels or paintings with subtlety or sufficient complexity and depth. Said argues that the representation of Western high culture served to ground the self-understanding of the West, even though it was portrayed as a universal with no geographical qualifier. The works of Austin, of Goethe, of Tennyson, and Carlyle, and Kipling, and so on, demonstrated the highest cultural achievements of the human race, and in this way helped to secure the legitimacy of Western claims to dominion over lesser groups. And so Said holds expressive artistic products and the interpretation of their meaning and significance made by experts together created a reservoir for identity formation of a certain sort. Ideas about the cultures to which we are related ground our sense of who we are, since they represent in visual and narrative form a moral life, a manner of reflective subjectivity, a form of intelligence, and in this way, a means to both differentiate and rank. Said's claim is that the contested terrain of culture, um, in the contested terrain of culture, it is important to protect positive interpretation, not only for the purposes of empire building, but simply for collective psychic affirmation. Ideas and claims about culture are central to identity intersubjective relations to hegemony, motivational structures, and to solidarity. So the decline of biological racism by the mid 20th century simply shifted racist and racial discourses onto the arena of a quite well-developed terrain. New concepts emerged to be sure, such as development versus underdevelopment, traditional versus historical, advanced versus backward, Terms like savage, barbarian, and primitive appear less often today, yet the new terms, as David Theo Goldberg has argued, map nicely onto the meanings of the old terms, collecting the same reference class. In truth, cultural racism is manifest in high culture, popular culture, and mass political discourse. Our current political divisions are generally seen as the struggle between open racists versus humanitarians, but neither side need engage with the issue of colonial history. So prior to the biological were geographical and environmental theories of human difference. One widespread idea was that hot and arid climate stymied industry and in progress that the indigenous could hunt, fish, and gather the resources they needed without major effort because they lived in areas with such plenty, and hence it was no wonder their scientific and intellectual achievements lagged behind. This explanation suggested a correspondence between moral and physical geography, as Santiago Castro Gomez argues, or a normative ordering, not just of bodies or body types, but of spatial terrains and environments. Countering environmental determinism requires different sorts of analysis than the later biological theories, which were eventually refuted most decisively through genetic research that disproved the inheritance of behavior. But the failure of the biological explanations led people back to the environmental theories. If the fact of inferiority was not explainable as a result of genetics, then some looked to social circumstances and this includes where people live. 
To provide sufficient resources for communities, though, practices of hunting, fishing, and gathering require an inordinate amount of knowledge, including the knowledge of sustainable practices, so that sources would not run dry. Such societies often require mobility, so the sophisticated practices of oceanic navigation developed by Micronesian groups informed and advanced the capacities of Western explorers. Mobility also required a lot of political knowledge in order to manage group relationships. To be a sustainable practice, group mobility cannot engender war or conflict every time the community has to move its domain. And this requires reflection on cooperation. Furthermore, lush tropical climates are not simply bounties of food resources, but dangerous environs that present numerous problems of pest control, requiring empirical observation and reasoning to address the problem in strategies such as inoculation. The people of the Chocó region in Colombia observed that predatory birds such as falcons could safely feast on venomous snakes, but typically ate a certain vine before beginning their pursuit. Based on this observation, they developed methods of vaccination by use of what they called falcon's vine, inoculating themselves from a deadly snake bite so that they too could operate in areas where such serpents were likely to be found. A Spaniard in the region, Pedro Fermin de, de Vargas, tested their vaccine on himself in the late 1700s and confirmed its reliability. The geographical theory of civilizational achievement remains common in current ideations of tropical paradises, even Greece and Italy, that are thought to produce informal, easygoing cultural practices and a lack of industriousness. But as a causal theory of cultural development, it was rejected by most scientists by the 20th century. Correlations such as those between environment and achievements do not establish causality. And in truth, the correlations were so variable that their purported explanatory role was defeasible. But the criteria by which cultures were comparatively ranked and the ways in which the West began to define knowledge, cultural achievement, and what it meant to be civilized were not challenged by the demise of the geographical explanation of human difference. We continue to rank and we continue to assume universal criteria that can identify advanced societies. This is simply to say that normative comparisons continue to be based on manifestly racist ideas and concepts that only a focus on cultural racism can unravel. Castro Gomez shows that in the Americas, the theory of difference that attributed environmental causes was not overturned because the actual achievements of peoples in these hot indoor arid regions gained broad recognition, but because these theories threatened white criollo power in the region. Fermin de Vargas, for example, says the credit for the falcon's vine vaccine did not go to the people who prepared the antidote, but to the falcons. Despite their observation, experimentation, and testing, the people of Choco were viewed as analogous to the animals thought to happen upon a technique of inoculation. And both judgments, I think, of, of both the people and the, and the animals are probably erroneous. White criollos were not opposed to the environmental theory of race because of its racism against local inhabitants, but because it began to be applied to them that is, descendants from Spain, who had settled in the New World. Some Europeans were so attached to environmental determinism that they believed white settlers would degenerate in the tropics, becoming lethargic, losing motivation, and thus be transformed into correlates of native groups. European blood was no match, they thought, for the effects of tropical paradise on one's disposition and motivation. Such arguments serve to legitimate ongoing European offshore rule, of course, which was under serious ideological attack by the late 18th century. Colonial rule gave Criollos significant privileges that came along with their functionary role for the monarchies back home, 
privileges including land and slaves, but they could not have independence. Against the idea that they were degenerating because of the climate, white criollos began to argue that the geographical theories were neglecting the issue of altitude. They pointed to city-states in the mountainous Andean regions and in the highlands of Mexico where cultural achievements flourished. In this way, they sought to hang on to the coattails of what they classified as the more superior indigenous cultures, such as the Incas and the Aztecs. In order to de defeat the claim that their own stock was an in, in an inevitable nosedive due to environmental influences. But such argumentative strategies left the racist criteria used for judging cultures undisturbed. The actual language of racism today is largely about cultures, sometimes religions, that act as proxies for cultural difference rather than genetics. The infamous conservative commentator Ben Shapiro argues that it is, quote, reason and moral purpose, unquote that made the West great, not colonial wars. The US President Donald Trump argued against accepting immigrants from what he called shithole countries, even if they were refugees fleeing wars and violence. Despite the wars of aggression waged by Christian dominant countries, such as the United States over the last 50 years, with hundreds of thousands of civilian lives lost, it is Islam that is portrayed as inherently oppressive, and so on and on. So of course, Putin made claims about the constitutive nature of Ukraine's cultural and historical relations to Russia, and disavowed its claim to cultural and linguistic independence. He is attempting to use cultural reasons to deny Ukrainians the right to political sovereignty. Truly sovereign states, Putin said in March of this year, are grounded in the, quote, inner energy, unquote, generated by common values, beliefs, and history. Thus, the mere existence of a governmental apparatus is insufficient to legitimate the right of non-intervention if the society lacks the grounds of sovereignty, that is, inner energy. Right-wing populists argue similarly that immigration weakens the spirit of commonalities that underlie national formations. Speaking in Warsaw and in, at the United Nations, former President Trump invoked the idea of sovereign societies rather than sovereign states and said that societies can only achieve sovereignty to the extent that citizens are willing to make significant sacrifices in order to protect and uphold their, quote, culture, faith, and tradition, unquote. Culture becomes the centerpiece insofar as a culture is defined by a shared substantive content and creed. Such ideas have long been part of modern notions of political community. Hobbes, for example, described the state as an artificial man with a soul expressed by its cultural forms. We need to take care about the way in which we criticize Putin's claims. Some retreat from the discourses of culture that Putin, Trump, Orban, and so many others are articulating and replace this with the idea of a political community as simply bound together in a very minimal way by institutional and legal commitments. A prominent example of this is Habermas. The advantage of this decultured definition is clear. Societies defined by their chosen institutions rather than shared culture can escape the historical determinism often invoked by white nationalism in which a group's cultural history is said to set the path for their enduring future. Avoiding issues of culture altogether can appear to be the best solution. And so, decultured concepts of political entities are thought to coexist more easily with pluralism in the religious and cultural spheres. But the disadvantage of this familiar, familiar classical liberal approach is that it becomes a form of avoidance, as if what holds societies together is formal, volitional, intellectual, and has nothing to do with shared values, forms of life, 
or historical experience. We then have no counter arguments to the claim that immigration will diminish our sense of relational commitments, our willingness to sacrifice for others in our communities. If we accept immigrants, it can only be on humanitarian grounds, which is an act of volitional charity, or sometimes on economic grounds, which is simple self-interest. We avoid the critical reflection on our own culture and can feel justified to demand assimilation, an inevitable failure. Cultures and nations are, of course, not natural kinds, but social constructions, both in a formative sense and in an interpretive sense. Their content and boundaries are always subject to motivated interpretation, but the content that we're interpreting is itself the product of dynamic historical movements, which are defined and de demarcated often by motivated interpretation. As those from the former Yugoslavia know, literary, musical, and other genres associated with Serbian or Croatian identities can be honed, promoted, funded, and shaped into instruments that can be used to try and establish the pedigree of distinct ethnic identities, while in other periods they can reveal pan-ethnic similarities. In this way, expressive arts are martial to the task of nation building and geopolitical conflict. But the line of argument that would make of culture a unified substance is both a danger and a mistake. Raymond Williams defined culture in his late work as, quote, a realized signifying system, unquote, rather than a reservoir of repository or a repository of unified content. In other words, culture is not a way of life of a people, but a process of meaning making in which what is shared are some historical experiences, living through the Blitzkrieg or Thatcherism, that becomes part of one's hermeneutic horizon. Williams pointed out that the word culture comes from the concept of cultivation, and thus it's not a noun, but a kind of practice. Signifying systems do not produce unanimity or uniformity, but there are patterns. He describes cultures as, quote, organized systems of practices, meanings, and values, unquote, from which new significations can emerge. Williams also stressed that the Weberian attempt to distinguish spheres of society in the modern era, distinctions that Weber and others used to establish cultures as more or less modern, that is more or less adva advanced, never hold in reality the organized system of practices, meanings, and values that Weber put in the category of culture is not separable, as he thought, from those that operate in the spheres of economics, politics, or spirituality. The extensive critiques of neoliberal economic ideas, just to give recent examples, show the ent entwinement of spheres in which facets of cultural histories render certain arguments intuitively plausible and new proposals feel familiar. Williams' approach is useful and helpfully concordant with the concept of the coloniality of power approach developed by Anibal Keanu and other decolonial theorists. And this is the idea that post-independence or post-formal independence, global relations are made infused by colonial meaning making. But Paul Gilroy and Stuart Hall as well, I think, sharply criticized Williams for conflating national with cultural identity which gives rise to the sort of exclusivist nationalism the fascists today, as in the past, dream of achieving. Gilroy worries that, in fact, both conservative and socialist treatments of culture sometimes events, quote, an absolutist definition of culture tied to a resolute defense of the idea of national community, unquote. The assumption that substantive cultural identity grounds national identity, providing the inner energy Putin makes necessary for sovereignty claims, will have the effect of centering some citizens and sidelining others, justifying immigration restrictions, among other things. Gilroy is also concerned that the belief that culture provides the ground of national claims produces an unproductive 
forms of resistance in the beleaguered community, such as cultural nationalism or what we used to call narrow nationalism. Such forms of resistance create all sorts of problems, from pressures to conform to efforts to make adoption of children follow racial lines. Gilroy, like Saeed, Fanon, and also Amakar Gabral, is as concerned with the ideas about culture in the resistance movements as he is with the ideas about culture in the conservative mainstream. I share Gilroy's worries, but again, the solution will not be found, I'll argue, in separating cultures from politics. I'll argue that we can reject the idea of culture as a uniform or unified way of life and the idea that this alone grounds national legitimacy. In this way, I think William's approach can be linked to a dynamic and open hermeneutic horizon that plays a role in the task of interpretation and judgment of the new from a place that contains substantive content from the past. New significations are, are never ex nihilo. A useful element of this process approach to culture is the idea of the cultural imaginary. And this is not simply a repository of meanings, but an operational apparatus in a Foucauldian sense. Foucault uses the idea of an apparatus or dispositif as a larger and looser amalgam that would include laws, institutions, and bureaucracies, but also has effect on the formation of identities and subjectivities. Castro Gomez takes up this concept to explore the apparatus of whiteness apparent in post-conquest societies which were organized with the aim of ensuring a livable life for white settlers. The emerging sciences of man that developed within colonial spaces with taxonomies of populations, creation of specific market rules and specific forms of governmentality gain intelligibility when we see them as connected by this apparatus of whiteness as playing a role in the process of signification, not simply its results. Castro Gomez argues that the apparatus of whiteness in settler societies of the modern period was concealed by what he calls the hubris of the zero point. The assumption of a disinterested, objective, sovereign gaze that disables the motivation for self-reflection and dialogical models of knowing. Coming into a foreign space with unfamiliar forms of life, colonizers took the stance of judge expert, interpreter, and arbiter of all conflict. The colonizer could judge, but not themselves be judged by those they classified as primitive. This resistance to external critique became instantiated in the scientific method, which as Boaventura de Sousa Santos notes, only subject to internal or imminent critique based on recognized expertise and shared methods of knowing. The hubris of the zero point, then, is this idea of perspectiveless, disembodied knowing, the knower who need not become the object of knowledge or engage with epistemologies diverse from his own. In this way, I suggest Castro Gomez's approach helps us to see that the idea of culture, relevant to the concept of cultural racism, is a mode of life that incorporates the habitus of groups and from which new knowledges and new possibilities of action are produced. If some groups have a habitus of being in a dominant position, able to choose between cruelty, disregard, or magnanimous charity, that habitual dominance is not itself dislodged whether one chooses disregard or charity. What's truly unsettling to such a signifying system and form of subjectivity is when the right to make unchallenged decisions comes to an end. This is what decolonization and looming demographic changes seem to threaten. Culture as an apparatus then denotes practices and a habitus, not conscious intention. The sovereign gaze of the zero point enacts racism as the epistemological level by preempting the scope of dialogue. As a signifying system then, the colonial cultures produce justify and consolidate racial perception and judgment with effects on the patterns of empathy and accepted doxa. Within the colonial matrix of power, biological racism emerged and bloomed for a time, but also other theories of human difference, 
such as environmental approaches and also evolutionary approaches that ranked groups on a single temporal map of progress as advanced or backward. Some approaches rendered inferior groups beyond intellectual development, but in others, which some modern Europeans held, such as John Stuart Mill, inferior groups could be brought into the light with the proper form of education. But this evolutionary development was not going to create equality. The position of the zero point conferred final arbitration only on the most advanced. This is the dominant ideation in the West today. Many peoples from underdeveloped societies have been redeemed by Western help, cosmopolitan experience, assimilation to the advanced cultures, and thus we have a happy visual diversity of peoples today in all of the major cities and media platforms of North America and Western Europe. This is not decolonization. The dominant colonial imaginary and its associated apparatus can accommodate structured refugee admissions, affirmative action, the forgiveness of some loans to the world banking system, and some other reforms. It can also survive the demise of biological racism and address ongoing implicit bias and the remaining vestiges of attitudinal racism with diversity training and focus groups. But what the colonial matrix of power cannot make sense of is the push against westernization or the decolonial critique of cognitive racism. De-westernization challenges the West at the epistemic level of its signifying system and means that the West must engage in dialogic engagement rather than assume a universal stance of unilateral judgment. And thus, de-westernization feels like chaos and anarchy. So unintelligible is it to the mainstream. Cultural racism, then, is most importantly a mode of judgment created over our long colonial history. It's built into scientific practices that claim hegemony in vaccine production on epistemic grounds and the exclusive right to nuclear weapons. It's not just a misperception of other cultures, but a way of seeing and knowing. It's central to nationalism and ethnic self-formation. But in my concluding section, I'll argue it need not be. So here's the last section. Here I want to develop an account of an antidote to cultural racism and the concept of transculturation from Ferdinand Ortiz. Ortiz's work provides us, I think, with a departure point from the West ruling fantasies of cultural superiority and the hubris of the zero point. But beyond this, I think Ortiz's work is also going to help us address the concerns of Fanon, Gilroy, and Cabral about the ways in which some forms of resistance to cultural racism and the defense of maligned cultures can reestablish ideals of cultural homogenization, exclusive ownership of cultures, and the possibility of cultural separatism. In Ortiz's work, the border zones of conflict are re-understood as internal <coughs> rather than exterior to cultural formation. National formations may be aligned with cultures, and yet cultures are re-understood as open and hybrid. So Ortiz was a Cuban anthropologist. He was writing in the um, early to mid 20th century. And his early work manifested aspects of cultural racism and a colonial mentality. In 1906, for example, he published a book about Afro-Cuban practices of sorcery which he took to be a sign of cultural backwardness. And he urged Cubans as a whole to acknowledge that theirs is an inferior culture in relationship to more evolved societies. But even in this early view, this inferior state was not presented as caused by race or as inevitable, and he believed that Cubans could choose a route leading to civilization rather than barbarism. And in this, he was very similar to the celebrated Uruguayan SOS, um, Jose Enrique Rodeau, who was writing around the same time. Ortiz thought, like Rodeau, that imbibing European intellectual culture was the cure for Latin America's cultural malaise. Such views are not surprising in the early 20th century. Ortiz had his academic training in Spain, and he was casting about for ways to improve the lot of his countrymen. <clears throat> 
As Fernando Coronel argues in his int introduction to Ortiz's work, Ortiz changed his assessment of Cuban culture as a result of the ferment of new anthropological and social theory during the first few decades of the 20th century. One of his main influences was the historian Ramiro Guerra y Sanchez, who gave a markedly different account of the root causes of corruption, poverty, and political authoritarianism in Cuba. Guerra located the source of this problem not in Cuba's non-European practices, but in its insertion in a global sugar industry. With its plantation economies, history of slavery, need for unskilled labor, and a seasonal workforce. The problem was not Cuba's culture, but the particular form of Cuba's dependent economy and its effect on the society at large. There were also further developments by social theorists who began to move away from the idea of culture as a singular universal, as Matthew Arnold had imagined, to the idea of multiple cultures that could not be ranked by a single uniform rubric, but instead could be seen as simply distinct. Franz Boas had a role to play here with his concept of cultural relativism, but Ortiz was actually more influenced by the work of Oswald Spengler, who was made use of by a number of Latin American intellectuals introduced to his work through its influence and translation in Spain. Prior evolutionary approaches to comparing cultures were moderated by Spengler's influence so that specific cultural forms, such as Afro-Cuban music, could be analyzed without being assessed on the basis of its comparison to European forms. New theories of plural cultures gave rise to a newly decentered global imaginary. So it is in his masterwork entitled Cuban Counterpoint, which was published in 1947, and is a treatise on the competing cultures of tobacco and sugar production, that Ortiz invents the new concept of transculturation that I want to make use of here. With this concept, Ortiz intended to provide alternatives to the concepts of assimilation and acculturation, which imagines the possibility of an individual losing their original culture in order to acquire another culture. Thus, both the concepts of assimilation and acculturation are imagined as operating in a unidirectional process, at least in North America. Assimilao does not have this, the same sort of connotations in Latin America of one-way change. Assimilation also often assumes an evolutionary model involving uplift. And acculturation similarly invokes an educational process in which one becomes cultured by adopting or adapting to the dominant and superior form of culture. Much of our current thinking about migration continues to operate with these concepts, albeit implicitly, so that the question is, can this particular group be assimilated, or are they too different? Will they be motivated to adopt the ways of the dominant culture, or will they be recalcitrant and oppositional to acculturation? The question of accepting migrants depends on the answer to these questions, and this is going on right now in Poland. By contrast, the concept of transculturation, as Ortiz develops it, involves a reciprocity in which all who come into contact are affected. Transculturation is neither a one-way nor a two-way assimilation. It's the creation of something new. Ortiz describes transculturation as a two-stage process that includes loss as well as creation. And I think it's important here to acknowledge, as Ortiz does, that in the encounter, there is a loss that disturbs the ground of one's prior identity and its signifying system for the production of meaning. But this is not a replacement theory since what emerges in the place of the lost cultural formation is a creative adaptation that involves both collective and individual agency. It's not one culture replaced by another, but a transformation that involves agency with often invigorating effects. Indeed, the central feature of Ortiz's account is the reciprocating influences that reconstitute all sides. Cultural boundaries are imaginary projections intended to protect existing forms of domination, 
they cannot but fail. Even if laws are put in place to ensure that only one language may be spoken, linguists find elements of the outlawed language cropping up in the dominant language, such as Irish inflected work in English or African influence in US English. Dominant religions enforced on all, such as Catholicism throughout the Americas, experienced major transformations, as historians of religion have shown. We have the indigenous of the Americas to thank for the prominence of the Virgin Mary, for example, who was before a marginal figure. As Fernando Coronel's interpretation of Ortiz makes clear, the concept of transculturation has a defetishizing effect. Ortiz's understanding of the relational nature of cultural formations undermines distinctions and binary oppositions, revealing the limits of their descriptive adequacy. Binaries can have a heuristic utility, but are misunderstood if taken to be fixed or stable. The geopolitics of transnational economies in the modern post-conquest era produce opportunities for creative forms of sociality that remain active even while they operate alongside colonialism and imperialism. It is not correct to name all of these transmutations of cultural forms as theft or appropriation. Perhaps the most important aspect that requires a liberatory analysis are the imaginative genealogies told about cultural creations and developments, such as when the genre of country music in the United States is characterized as originally white, even though its instruments, such as the banjo and its musical style, such as picking rather than strumming the guitar, were borrowed and creatively transformed from African Americans. On Ortiz's view, neither the dominant nor the subordinate side can effectively patrol their borders. New histories of modern science and modern political theory, such as in David Graeber and David Wingo's The Dawn of Everything, are retelling the story of European modernity as a process of transculturation in Ortiz's sense. It was the encounter with native cultures, value systems, and forms of life that animated the imaginations of Montesquieu, Rousseau, Condorcet, and Kant, sparking new debates about the forms of life previously accepted in the elite circles of European societies. Indigenous peoples found the European practice of subordination to the aristocracy inexplicable. Why people had to prostrate them prostrate themselves and perform obsequiousness to others whose only claim was land. Or why communities with abundance would do nothing for those starving, ill, and homeless in their midst. This American indigenous critique, as Graeber and Wingro call it, initiated new questions that in some cases provoked new justifications, but in other cases, such as with Rousseau, led to new anti-authoritarian directions in European political theory. Such new intellectual histories demonstrate what Ortiz named transculturation, in which both destructive or critical and constructive or creative effects emerge from encounters between peoples, fostering new forms of integration and interdependence. Even subordinate groups are very much a part of the intellectual and political story of modernity. Yet the myths of modernity, as Enrique Dussel calls them, have covered over and misrepresented our cultures to make it appear that Europe was, like God, self-caused. Ortiz developed his transculturation theory very self-consciously from the periphery, from a colonized area of the world, to push against received ideas, including his own earlier received ideas. He understood himself to be describing the most profound experience of cultural transformation in recorded history, that in the so-called New World. He writes, here's a passage. There was no more important human factor in the evolution of Cuba than these continuous, radical, contrasting geographic transmigrations, economic and social, of the first settlers from Europe the perennially transitory nature of their objectives and their unstable life in the land where they were living in perpetual disharmony with the society from which they drew their living. Men, economies, cultures, ambitions were all foreigners here 
provisional, changing, birds of passage over the country at its cost against its wishes and without its approval." Unquote. Ortiz also developed the concept of transculturation with the central example not of aesthetic expression or religious practices or other domains generally associated with the word culture, but principally through an analysis of the colonial agriculture in Cuba based on tobacco and sugar production. Thus, he places cultural forms in the context of economies, not to establish cause in the final instance, but to demonstrate the elaboration of forms of life that could accord with the particular way these products were produced in this colonial space. Here's another passage. He says, tobacco requires delicate care. Sugar can look after itself. The one requires continual attention. The other involves seasonal work. Intensive versus extensive cultivation, steady work on the part of the few, intermittent jobs for many, the immigration of whites on the one hand, the slave trade on the other, liberty and slavery, skilled and unskilled labor, hands versus arms, men versus machines, delicacy versus brute force. The cultivation of tobacco brought about the small holding, that of sugar brought about the great land grants, the native against the foreigner, national sovereignty against colonial status, the proud cigar band as against the lowly sack." Unquote. So I really, you know, he's not the only one who developed ideas of cultural reciprocity, but I think this, his work really should be more widely read precisely because of this detailed contextualism by which he develops the concept out of the economy. He describes Cuban history as an intense, unbroken process of transculturation of human groups, all in a state of transition, and he suggests that this is not just the story of Cuba, but of the whole of the Americas. He traces its effects in economic practices, as well as forms of music, dance, and humor, the shared sensibilities of uprootedness manifest in every cultural form. The rumba has no origin story that can establish a pure lineage or singular geographic source. The antiphonal and percussive elements of Cuban music today is a creative response to the joy that sometimes accompanied contact. Europe has a different history than the Americas. But since the time when it became self-consciously Europe, self-identified as Europe, it too should be understood as the product of a transculturation wrought by imperial conquest and subsequent migrations. Mobile borders, multiple empires, some of which were centered outside of Europe, as well as the contact between majority and minority cultural communities here, such as the Roma, the Sinti, and Jewish groups. Thus, Europe has been transculturated since its inception. And it is not only now that it is being affected by immigrant populations. Transculturation replaces the replacement theory with a more accurate account of what has happened and what is likely to continue. But the concept comes essentially out of the experience of the so-called New World or Western Hemisphere more thoroughly and deeply altered than anywhere else in the European Empire. For a long time, Latin American intellectuals bridled under the European assessment that ours was a debased hybridity, as if the mix of peoples and cultures meant it could have no internal spirit, to quote Trump and Putin, no coherent cultural essence to contribute in Hegelian fashion to the development of the world spirit. Against those who denounced mixing, influential thinkers such as Martí and Vasconcelos found ways to valorize the creative potential of mestizaje, and even to portray the mix as itself superior to more abundant ideals of cultural stasis. These ideas of mestizaje were often put to the service of projects of post-colonial nation state formation, and are today receiving needed critique as harboring, in some cases, anti-black and anti-indigenous racisms of their own. If the national identity is predicated on the superiority of the mestizo, this leaves unchallenged the old ideas about the cultural backwardness of continuous or so-called traditional communities that share ethnicities or ethno-races. <clears throat> 
But the concept of transculturation is not made use of by Ortiz to aid in the glorification of mestizaje, but as a more descriptively accurate account of mutual transformations and creative agency enhanced by the experience of contact. Here is a different source of inner energy than homogeneity, and here there is no zero point. The practice of normatively ranking cultures assumes distinctions that colonialism destroyed. Cultural racism today is a vestige of empire's attempt to maintain its hold over the historical narrative and the myth of the integrity of boundaries. So I'm going to conclude with some thought on the role of cultural racism in national formations as a way of understanding the sources of its influence and where we go from here. So here's the concluding section. White nationalism is today a transnational phenomena whose basic premise that a community of ethnically homogeneous citizenry has privilege over a geographical territory finds resonance in many non-white parts of the globe, such as India most notably, in which a kind of ethno-essentialism grounds national identity and the right to exclude. But we should be clear that ethnic essentialisms of this sort are enabled by cultural racism. Others are thought to be justifiably excluded, not simply because they may be newer to the nation, but because they have a bad culture. So how does the concept of transculturation help? I've argued that claims about cultures are a critical site of political contestation. They're not a diversion from material or economic issues. Culture concerns ways of life, including ways of making a life and a living, not merely docs or ideology. I've argued that there's no need to take off our critical hats to avoid cultural racism. What we need to avoid are the colonialist concepts of advanced and backward, traditional versus historical. Attending to cultural racism will link present day racisms to the transnational histories of colonization which have given us bad concepts and misleading binaries, as well as mobilizing fear and creating causal misdirection. But I've also argued that the solution to cultural racism cannot be a refusal to engage with the concept of culture, however messy it is. Nor can we succeed with the strategy of avoiding cultural issues to focus on volitional political commitments. We need to engage with the epistemic concepts and procedures of judgment that produced cultural racism over the colonial period. And we need to counter cultural racism's claims with a better descriptive account of how cultures in the modern world have come about and what this portends for the future increased migrations that are inevitable across the world. The concept of transculturation instructs against the strategy of defending immigration on the grounds that our country won't change, or that the charges of loss are mere scaremongering. Some demographers have attempted to show that immigrants are not to be feared because they will assimilate. It is true that intensity of religious practice is reduced in a generation or two after immigration and that intermarriages further affect the socialization of children. But this argument only tracks a one-way assimilation and leaves unchallenged the desire for French culture, for example, to remain intact. Without minimizing conflict, Said pointed out in his last book, Humanism and Democratic Culture, that, quote, far more than they fight, cultures coexist and interact fruitfully with each other. Said reminds us that anti-humanism developed in the United States partly out of revulsion with the war in Vietnam. And the wielding of the concept of humanism by conservatives as a strategy to maintain the untouchability of the great books canon, then under assault by student radicals. But soon, as he recounts, anti-humanism became infallible doctrine and was used ironically to represent the Western Academy as more theoretically and politically advanced than any other. Said suggests we return to Vico for our understanding of humanism, not as doctrine, 
but it's practice, a making relation to knowledge. What unites human groups is their universal capacity to make knowledge, as opposed to absorbing it passively, reactively, dully, he says. He believed that, quote, one can be critical of humanism in the name of humanism, and that schooled in its abuses by the experiences of Eurocentrism and empire, one could fashion a different kind of humanism, unquote. His is, I suggest, a humanism without empire. A rejection of ranked types in favor of the claim that all human groups engage in meaning making. This was also the basic idea of Las Casas' defense of the Indians in the mid 16th century debate with Juan Inez Sepulveda. The Aztec should not be classed as barbarians or animalistic, Las Casas argued, because they had reasons for what their actions were. Thus, from the very beginning of modernity up to its present day, there have been contesting alternatives to cultural racisms, alternatives we very much need to resuscitate in these dark times. Thank you. Thanks so much indeed, Linda. There's, there's, a, there's a heck of a lot to take in there. Um, fortunately, fortunately, as you can see, the event's being recorded, and you'll very soon be able to uh, watch it again and uh, sort of go into some of the more, more details. We were due to finish sort of very, very soon. I, I will, though, just Sorry. indulge, <laughs> indulge uh, as by taking a couple of questions. So apologies if that <coughs> runs, runs over. I do appreciate some people will, will have to leave. But... Let's just take one or two quick questions if we can. Uh, yeah, we have a hand there. Do you have a, a microphone near you? Yeah, go on. So thank you very much for your talk. I, I think you raised some interesting issues. But what, what, one thing is, when, when we talk about ordering and culture, often you talked about historical imperialism. But surely, in, in ordering, we understand different cultures, there has to be some sense of ordering, a sense of value. So I put it here. Take, <coughs> let's say, genital mutilation or treatment of women. In a way, liberal democracies in the West, things have progressed from a hundred years without understanding some of those things about value. Is it wrong to rank cultures if, if we believe those things to be morally wrong. So we have to start from a, a, some kind of moral value. Thanks, so much. I'm just going to summarise the question for the sake of recording. So, uh, so basically, the essence of the question is that you were talking about the ways in which you know, the Western, Westerners are ranked civilizations according to values and so forth. But the challenge is, doesn't there have to be some kind of ranking? And is it just the case that some practices are uh, better than others? And the example was given of uh, female gen genital mutilation. This was the one question I knew I was going to get. <laughs> um, I don't um, disallow criticism, right, between cultures. The question, but ranking on a universal rubric is a problem, given the colonialist history. Um, and it, it, because it's a way of, of, um, of getting out of dialogic work of, um, in which all parties have some epistemic um, respectability. I, I'm not an expert on, on this particular thing. I, I would uh, really strongly recommend everybody read Serene Cotter's book, Decolonizing Universalism. She's developing just the smartest, she's a brilliant philosopher, and she's developing just the smartest account of how to do transnational feminism on these very topics. Um, in a way that is not imperialistic um, and can think about um, uh, complications. What she points out, and, and the example that you use, you know, is, is very um, extreme and in some ways fairly obvious, but there's lots of other examples like um, women working for wage labor, not having a gender division of labor inside the home or in terms of care for children, and a lot of things like that that are also used today to rank cultures in terms of um, 
their levels of feminism and sometimes to justify unilateral military invasions, of course, in places um, that um, governments have other reasons to invade that have nothing to do with a lot of women but are, are used in that way. And what Cotter argues is that um, what we have this kind of missionary feminism in the West, she calls it, in which we take what we imagine to be the most liberated lives, which turns out to be the professional uh, managerial class of uh, global North countries, the lives of women who are in the professional managerial class of, of global North countries, and we take that to be the highest standard, and then we, we, we look, we rank countries on the basis of that. And it, it's a, the reason it's a problem is because the liberation, one of the reasons it's a problem is because the liberation of women in the professional managerial class in the global north is made it, you know, possible by hiring immigrant labor at low rates to, to do the domestic labor. So the care labor hasn't actually been um, distributed equally along gender lines. It's just been taken off. So th there's lots of ways in which I really recommend people to read Serene Cotter's book, and you know, and, and because she goes into more detail than I am. Um, but what I want to say to you is, I, I think you need to. I would urge you to think about separating ranking which requires universal criteria that are generally achieved in a unilateral way from um, critical engagement. Okay. Thanks so much. We will just take one more because we're already running over time. I think I did, the hand here was... Uh, let's, let's, use, let's, let's take this one up here. Thank, thank you. Sorry. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your talk and I look forward to listening to it or reading it sometime again. Um, my question is about the strength of the trans culture that, that you were describing. Um, I'm not sure if it was meant to be a descriptive project or a prescriptive project, um, because you started your talk with the limitations of equity, diversity and inclusion work, for example, because of how it fails to dismantle um, the uh, racist structures that, and institutions that we work within. So I'm wondering, is transculturalism strong enough to dismantle? Thank you. Yes. Again, thanks. I'll just like a brief summary. I won't do justice to the question again, just for the benefit of recording. So. The question here is just about um, whether to the extent to which transculturalism is a, a description of what actually happens or a prescription for what should happen, and, and how much can we really expect from it? Um, how optimistic should we be that it's a project that can succeed? Thank you, and I should say this work is very much a work in progress, so I'm open to all these. And if you have questions that don't, we don't have enough time for, um, feel free to email me with them. Okay and we can have further conversations. It, it's a, you know, it's a, essentially a, a redescription, I would say. Um, and it's a, but it's a redescription with important implications because it's a, it, the redescription retells the, all of the, and undermines the legitimating myths of Western supremacy, right? So the great traditions of European political theory have to be rethought. Um, and um, the histories of science, there's some wonderful young historians of science doing this work all over the world to show the actual um, sources of the development of the European sciences, navigational, agricultural, all kinds of, of sciences. N not to say the West played no role, but just to say it was a combination. And sometimes there was theft and appropriation but sometimes there was genuine sort of learning collectively. But that story has been just, you know. Um, so I think that the story of Western hegemony and the, of Western supremacy is, the, is a story that legitimates these invasive unilateral wars my country has been engaging in 
and does a Gramscian trick of, of winning hegemony, you know, among broad members of the public. Um, and it's, it's based on falsehoods. So I, I do think that there's, I mean, it's kind of like ideology critique here, but it is, it's a redescription that's really getting at the critical piece, I think, of what legitimates the idea that we can decide whether or not to accept immigrants from the global north. It's entirely in our hands of settler colonial societies, such as in the Americas or Australia. Um, it's entirely legitimate for us to make unilateral decisions, and sometimes those decisions can be based on assimilability and whether or not we think certain groups pose a danger or are capable of being assimilated. Um, and I, I also think that, you know, I think we need, to th we need to talk more about the great replacement theory. And I think a lot of intellectuals don't want to talk about it because it's so stupid and so ridiculous. How can anybody, you know, it doesn't, it's not worth our time. It is huge. A third of people in the United States today believe some version of it. And it's only been, you know, around um, in the last uh, year in a, in a big public way. Fox News. Um, the conservative TV news outlet is, is supporting the replacement theory on a regular basis. So we need to think about the replacement theory and we need to not only critique it, we need to come up with alternatives. And this is what the left is not always good at, right? We're not always good at um, constructive, uh, real, realistic alternatives to um, just shutting our borders and keeping all the resources for ourselves um, sort of ideas as a way to maintain the living standards of working people or something like that. So I, I also think that um, transculturation has a role to play. Um, this is, it's insufficient, but I think it's an important concept um, in, in moving us to think about um, what's wrong with the replacement theory? And I, you know, I heard this really wonderful, you know, very progressive French demographer just a few months ago give this talk. They're they're trying very hard to show the, the demographic patterns in Europe and to show that the immigrants are not destroying the French cheese industry. And you know, because this is this is the kind of stuff people will say. They don't eat the cheese. What's wrong with people? <laughs> Um, and so the demographers, and in France, of course, it's very hard because they can't, you know, get statistics on racial identities. So they, they've been following the right wing. The right wing um, uses sickle cell anemia as a proxy for racial identity and finds the towns or the neighborhoods where there's high incidence of sickle cell anemia. And that is a good proxy, right, to find out where Africans are living. So <clears throat> the French demographers were following their lead <laughs> to try to find out patterns, and they find that, that people do change their religions, and they do intermarry, and, and they in, in some cases become less um, observant of their religions and so forth. And all of that is true. But this strategy of saying, it's all OK, you don't have to change. It's all okay, you're not gonna lose anything. This is not a good strategy, right? We have, to, we have to think beyond that and not be so defensive and see that yes, and admit that there is going to be loss. Right, there is loss. But there is also um, a chance for a creative change and God knows we need it. <laughs> well, it's an inc incredibly um, timely talk, um, particularly in, in Europe at the moment. Uh, the country of one half of my family, Italy, has just elected a government which is very much um, promoting this idea of this essential, unchanging um, culture, which is very strange because Italy wasn't even in a country till a little over 100 years ago, and it's, it's based on New World tomatoes and Far Eastern basil. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a story of transculturation, and it's a story that's being denied. And I think a lot of us sort of like can, can smell, smell a rat with a lot of these things, but I think what your talk has really given us a lot of really sort of like fine-grained tools to understand this a lot better and to help us to perhaps you know, respond to it in these more constructive 
and intelligent way. So thank you very much indeed for that. I'm, I'm sorry I don't have time for more questions. I think Linda was sincere when she said do email if you've got anything you want to follow up on. Um, if you haven't been to any Royal Institute of Philosophy events before, uh, we're beginning our annual London lecture series next week. These talks occur on Fridays um, throughout October through to March. Not every single one. Check the website for when they're on. The theme is words and world, so we're talking about philosophy of language in a, in a very eclectic way. The first talk, in fact, is on uh, Chinese philosophy of language and how it's relevant for us today. So do, if you're not on the mailing list, do please um, sign up. But for now, it's just, uh, could you join me one more time in thanking Linda Martin? I'll thank you.